Hello, welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're starting a brand new book because it's the first Friday in August. And this book is called The Leaving by Tara Altabrando. And I'm just gonna read the description to you because I think that sums it up best. 11 years ago, six kindergartners went missing without a trace. After all that time, the people left behind moved on or tried to until today. Today, five of those kids return. They're 16 and they are fine. Scarlet comes home and finds a mom she barely recognizes and doesn't really recognize the person she's supposed to be either. But she thinks she remembers Lucas. Lucas remembers Scarlet too, except they're entirely unable to recall where they've been or what happened to them. Neither of them remembers the sixth victim, Max, the only one not to come back which leaves Max's sister, Avery, wanting answers. She wants to find her brother dead or alive and isn't buying this whole memory loss story. But as details of their disappearance begin to unfold, no one is prepared for the truth. So we're gonna actually read the first four chapters of this book today, just because it's a little confusing what's going on at first and it helps to have a few chapters to go on. Also, they're short chapters. And this week and next week are the final weeks of Teen Story Share for the summer because after August, after August 12th, we're going to take a little break and then we'll start up again in September. The lights hurt my eyes and mommy is crying and not looking at me. I am on her hip with woof woof between us. I am wearing my monkey pajamas. I am supposed to be in bed. But mommy and then daddy came into my room and turned on the light and said, sweetie, we just need to do this thing. It's important. Then you can go right back to sleep. Daddy scooped me up and I grabbed Woof Woof because he goes where I go, especially if it's someplace important. Max isn't here. Max isn't in his fireman pajamas. Today was his first real day of kindergarten and he didn't come home. I don't know why and I'm afraid to ask because that is why mommy has been crying started at the bus stop. The bus came, but Max wasn't on it. I went to ask, is Max dead? As daddy puts me in my car seat. But I don't want to because I don't know what dead means except that it's bad. Maybe kindergarten is bad too. Maybe it takes you away and makes moms and dads sad. The lights that hurt are on big cameras where we end up, in front of a big building that looks like it is made of gray Legos. They make night feel like day. They make me feel weird about my pajamas. There are men talking into big microphones and I haven't seen my Minnie Mouse microphone in a while and it seems like my toys have started disappearing. Did Max take them with him? Men are talking, like grown-ups with rules. Then daddy is right next to me and mommy with a microphone, lollipop close to his mouth. Fishy camera eyes are pointed at us. He is saying, please bring back our son. Bring all the children back unharmed. A woman screams, my daughter said she was going on a trip to the leaving. Does anyone know what that means? And mommy looks at me like she's only just remembering that she's holding me. And I squeeze my thighs around her tight so that now I can lean toward the camera and the world gets quiet. So I say, I really want Max to come home. Mommy lets out a sound I have no word for and pulls my head into the space between her head and her soft parts and pushes through all those shoulders and elbows and arms. Woof Woof is gone and I think about screaming. Then I do. My father says, here, and he has Woof Woof. I grab him and hug him and his brown ears smell like sleep and apple juice and my thumb that I suck and I say, Woof Woof, I thought I lost you. And he has these two eyes that are stitched out of thread and they are wide apart. And I know he's not real, but for the first time ever, he looks so very sad. So sad that it hurts to look at him. I find mommy's shoulder and find my thumb and close my eyes to make it all go away. Day zero. Scarlet. Like being ripped open, mid-nightmare, breathless in the center of a scream. Her hands went to the knot on the blindfold at the back of her neck. It was tied tight. It hurt her fingers to undo it. Then her eyes were freed. Night, heat, palm trees. 
Where are we? A girl. What's going on? A boy. She turned, saw the others, saw him. His name was something with an L. He took off running after the van, screaming, stop, wait. One tail light out, tires screeching, gone. Lucas, his name was Lucas. And hers? They'd gotten out of that white van just a moment ago, three rows of seats, ripped leather upholstery that dug into her thigh. She had spent the journey fighting sleep or something and working hard not to tear the blindfold off. He'd said not to, it had been important to behave. Where are we? A girl, Sarah? Screaming. Who was that? Adam, his name was easy, biblical, paced. Who was driving? She studied him, his skin light brown, darker than the others, then his clothes, black shirt, black jeans, sneakers, then Lucas's. Scar? He was staring at her. What scar? Where? Oh, Scarlet. Her name was Scarlet. You okay? He came closer. She studied her own clothes, swallowed to wet her throat. Why are we all wearing the same thing? I think I'm having a panic attack, Sarah said. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Just calm down. The first words out of k k Kristen's mouth. Why should I calm down? Again, Sarah screaming. Something was poking Scarlet's hip. Two of her fingers slid into her right jeans pocket, found a folded slip of paper, took it out, unfolded it. What's that? Lucas asked. Lines, this way and that. A map. The others dug through pockets. They all had maps. Her eyes found a red inked star on hers and saw her nails were also red, worn and chipped, like blood leaking out of her cuticles. I think this is a map to my house, Lucas said. 33 Locust Place. Mine's not ringing any bells. Kristen flipped to the other side of her map and back. Maybe I got the wrong one. She wasn't chewing gum, but Scarlet pictured her that way, always chewing. Scarlet turned, a slide, some swings, a gate, a thought about a cracked tooth, a boy. Had it been Lucas? No, but her feet had orders, marched toward the playground, stood at the center on the springy blacktop. A warm wind woke an old swing. It squeaked and swung a ghost child. I've been here, Scarlet said to no one. The others came in too. She stopped at a red horse on a springy coil, the kind you sit on and rock. Sarah was all panic. Why don't we remember where we live? Good question. Better question, why don't we remember everything? The horse's eyes spied, crickets pulsed. The wind whipped palm trees into whispers. The world folded in. This was the cliff of Scarlet. No idea how she'd gotten here. The path behind her was wiped clean. She knew the others, and she could not think of a thing they'd done before. This. Her mind clicked its blankness at her. Three times. We must have been drugged, Adam said. He was taller and more muscular than Lucas, but somehow not as confident. Does anyone remember who was driving? Lucas asked. Or where we were when we got into the van? Were we all at a party or something? Head shook. The wind died and the swings froze, a still photograph. Adam said, I don't remember anything. It has to be a drug. It'll wear off, Lucas said. Another car drove by, extra lights under the body and a bass heavy music blasting. Scarlet's heart rattled and settled. Probably drugs. If not that, what? Sarah was shaking her head. I don't understand what's happening. She walked in small circles, rubbing her hands together. We should go home. Lucas held up his map. Someone will know what's going on. What if it's a trap? Sarah's eyes were drowning. Why would there be a trap? Kristen looked like she was about to hail a cab or hitch a ride, anything to get away from them. Adam said, why should we trust whoever dropped us off here and gave us these? He wagged his map around. There's no point in standing here talking about it, is there? Kristen bent, retied her shoelace, and then stood. I guess I'll see you guys around. 
She started to walk off, but Lucas grabbed her. Wait, just wait. Why? We should have a plan, he said. We should, I don't know, get our story straight. There is no story, Kristen said. The story is we have no idea what's going on, so let's go home. What else is there to do? We'll go, yes. He released her arm. She rubbed it. But let's meet back here tomorrow night, like eight o'clock, just to make sure we're okay, just to make sure we've gotten some answers and snapped out of it, whatever it is. Scarlet was running into dead ends, circling back on herself. She was non-linear, looped, cycling back again and again to a memory of riding in a hot air balloon, happy and unafraid. So yes, definitely drugs, had to be. Somebody will be able to explain, Lucas said. Somebody will know what happened. What if we can't get away tomorrow? Sarah's circling was surely making her dizzy. Maybe we should go to a hospital and get checked out. No hospitals, Lucas shook his head. Meet back here tomorrow night at eight, okay? And if that doesn't work out for whatever reason, we try the next night, same time. Sarah stopped circling. Everyone nodded except Scarlet, who looked at her map again. That red star, was the address familiar or just generic? Scar, Lucas said. There was something between them, something extra, something else. Tomorrow night, him again, okay? Lucas. He couldn't walk fast enough, pushed his calf muscles to the limit, stretched the very definition of walking, not good enough, started to run, slowly at first, a jog, then faster, his sneakers slapping the pavement hard and loud, faster and faster. The red star promised answers, relief, sleep, but he had to stop, bend, breathe, because the world spun. He was standing perfectly still, but he was on a carousel. White horse, golden reins, a bubblegum pink tongue. He was being carried around and around while sun blazed off the ocean like white fire. He was holding on for dear life and loving it. He closed his eyes, shook his head and arms, started to walk again, focusing on a point far ahead to try to fight dizziness. It was annoying, the spinning. Carousel horse, carousel tongue, carousel white fire. What carousel? He had no time for it. He took off again, overshot the address he was looking for and had to double back, winded to find the old red trailer house. But between there and here, there was, what would you even call it? A sculpture park? A monument? Hundreds, no thousands of rocks formed a pathway that his feet started to follow. To the right, the path divided off toward a rain collecting pool. To the left, some kind of tunnel, and ahead, more spiraling walkways and stairs and bridges. It felt ancient, sacrificial, like built on bones. Still, Red Star, answers. He kept walking, then spotted a figure way up back on the slope. A man in a lighted hat, holding a chisel. His father? Had made this? Was still making it? Dad? he called out, hearing his uncertainty and confusion, and the figure in the distance turned. Standing on a tall platform of stone, the man took his hat off, dropped it, and squinted into the night. Ryan? sounded confused. No, Ryan was a boy. A brother? Lucas. Is this some kind of joke? Now angry. He started to approach, and Lucas called out, Not a joke! Why would he be joking? The man inspected him from the top of a ladder steep set of stone steps. Oh my goodness, Lucas! And started to run down and then he slipped and as if in slow motion, tumbled and bumped and then landed head first with a dull smack on stone. Lucas ran to him, Dad! And bent to help him up. He lifted his head, Dad! And it was all warm and black and all over his hand. No, Lucas stood backing away. No, 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 no. Then one more try. Dad! Only the hum of the night, distant cars, tree frogs, a far off motorboat. The sound of it echoed inside him, his body hollow. He stood, ran to the house, pounded on the door until it opened. Ryan, but not a boy, grown. 
Call an ambulance, Lucas barked. Now! Who the hell? Just do it! Then ran back to the body, ear to mouth, hands to chest, pumping. Then a minute later, Ryan. Get away from him! What did you do? Hands grabbing Lucas by his shirt, hauling him to his feet. Fists, arms, legs, a pain in his jaw. It's me, Lucas! Between gasps, they froze. Ryan stared. What did you say? It's me, he said again. Lucas! Why would his own brother not recognize him? Then hands again, pushing him back and back and back and his bones hitting stone and Ryan saying, Where have you been? And their faces inches apart, Lucas's skull pressed to the wall and spit from Ryan's mouth in Lucas's eye when he said, Where could you possibly? Now Lucas was sure his head would crack. Have been. Avery. The phone rang. The clock glowed a red 12.45 a.m., but Avery wasn't going to get out of bed for the landline. It was probably just Dad all messed up about the time zones on day one of a business trip out west, and anyway, it was spring break. The plan was to sleep as late as she could and then make her way to a lounge chair by the pool out back and spend the day there watching boats go by in the bay. She'd practice for auditions next week and maybe invite Sam and Emma over to hang out and swim. Whenever her dad was away on business, Avery liked to pretend that their house was hers alone. With her mom usually sleeping or shopping, it was pretty easy. Mom probably hadn't even heard the phone. She was a deep sleeper right next to her pill bottles. But then it rang again and again. Avery heard her mom groan and then say, hello? Then silence. Then, oh my goodness, like out of a horror movie. Then more, oh my goodness. Avery kicked her comforter and went to her parents' room, where her mom was on her knees by the nightstand, crying, saying, no, not yet. I should go. I should get ready. Mom? Avery crouched down, bracing for some kind of bad news about her dad. A plane crash, maybe? A car accident? Get ready for what? Mom looked up and smiled and clutched the phone to her heart. They're back! Avery's grandparents had just taken a trip up to New York, but that hardly seemed worthy of a wee hours phone call. Who's back? Your brother, she said. The others. Then she pushed back Avery and said, I'm going to be sick, but... Avery had years ago stopped imagining it would ever happen and certainly hadn't pictured it happening this way, her holding her mom's hair as she retched up nothing at all. Where are they? Avery actually looked around the room. The shower dripped once. How? That was Peggy. Her mother wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. She said Kristen showed up at the house and said they're back. They're fine. She doesn't remember anything. She said none of them do but they're fine. They turned up with just the clothes on their backs. Then with her eyes wide and wild, she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I seriously can't believe it. Can you believe it? Like a crazy person, again. Avery followed as her mom walked downstairs and through the kitchen and stopped to fix her hair in the mirror that hung beside a massive floral arrangement mostly sunflowers that Rita had clipped from the front yard and then gotten an earful from mom about. Her mom then turned and opened the door and Avery half expected her brother to be there, too shy to knock after so many years away. What would he even look like? Would she like him? They don't remember anything? He wasn't there. She and her mom stood out on the porch for a while, looking up and down the quiet road. Eventually, they sat down on the top front step, still in pajamas, and waited. All right, next Friday we'll read a few more chapters of this book. I hope you found it interesting and intriguing so far, and have a great weekend. Bye!